So for those of you who don't know me or if anyone's online and hasn't met me yet, my name is Citarella Glava. I'm the current PGY2 um, infectious disease pharmacy resident. And today I'm going to be presenting uh, a presentation I did for my grand rounds to the pharmacy audience, but I'd like to see how it does with the ID fellow audience. So it's called Procalcitonin Advantages and Disadvantages of Procalcitonin Guided Therapy. So before I start, I'd like to say that I have nothing to disclose. And these are the objectives we're going to be covering today. So we're going to review procalcitonin um, and advantages and disadvantages of procalcitonin guided therapy compared to other biomarkers, analyze current literature to determine where exactly we can use procalcitonin, and then develop a patient-centered um, treatment and monitoring plan using procalcitonin guided therapy. And then just to spice up this presentation, I did add my Bitmoji throughout it just to, just to help us out. All right, so when I first started this presentation, I started thinking about kind of the evolving world of stewardship and when antibiotics were first discovered in the early to mid 1900s, they were really considered a medical miracle because they led to the decrease in pretty much like deaths to a lot of people. So over time, however, we've seen that um, the misuse and the overuse of antibiotics has increased. So with that, so has C. diff infections and so has antimicrobial resistance. So that's really where antimicrobial stewardship has come into play. So with stewardship, we're really looking at improving antibiotic use to enhance patient outcomes. And by doing that, we are um, decreasing side effects and then decreasing that resistance as well. So over the past few years, there's been a lot of um, attention towards and uh, focus towards diagnostic stewardship, which is pretty much using diagnostic tests, so uh, procalcitonin, imaging, urine antigens in order to improve patient care and then decrease antibiotic use. So overall, what I wanted to focus on um, for this presentation with diagnostic stewardship and also procalcitonin in general is um, just to get you all a little bit more familiar with procalcitonin because from my experience, um, many clinicians, myself included, we know that it's there, but we don't know how to maybe properly use it, properly follow up with those levels, when to get those levels and what population to use it in. So really this will be just um, a really good over overview of where the literature stands with procalcitonin and how we can all use it in our practice. Okay, so before I get into uh, procalcitonin, I'd like to just highlight a couple of biomarkers that uh, we typically see when we look at infectious patients. So I did this poll with um, the pharmacy uh, pharmacists as well, and I'd kind of like to see what the ID fellows come up with. So when you guys get a new consult and you're looking at you know, this new consult and this patient, what, um, when you're evaluating them for an infectious process, what biomarkers do you usually look at first? CDC. Okay. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are all good ones. I think Johanna said ESR, CRP, um, Andrew said CBC. If anyone's listening, you can type in your, text your answers to Andrew because that seemed to work out well uh, <laughs> last time. Um, so again, those are all really good biomarkers to look at. Uh, when we're looking at if a patient has an infectious process, whether we should start antibiotics, we really want to order a biomarker that kind of fits some SMART criteria. So really what are the qualities of a, an ideal biomarker? So what I came up with and what research shows, they have this acronym called SMART. So we want a biomarker that is um, sensitive and specific. So if a patient has a bacterial infection, we want, to be, we want this biomarker to be able to detect it and rise in its presence. And we also want it to be specific enough so that it could tell us whether it's a bacterial or fungal or viral infection. We want it to be measurable, available, and affordable, um, responsive. So if we do start a patient on appropriate therapy, we want that biomarker to show a decrease like a procalcitonin would. Um, and we want it to be timely. So as we all know, infections can progress pretty quickly. So we want a biomarker with favorable kinetics. Um, we want it to be high so we can guide us towards initiating antibiotics and then diminish quickly so we can guide us in um, cessation of those antibiotics. So sorry, it's a little bit cut off, but this is a table that compares some of the common um, biomarkers that even some of you mentioned and how they fit that SMART criteria. So the first one says fever. Um, and when we're looking at fever, it's really easy to do, really easy to look at a temperature to figure out. It's simple, it's sensitive. However, it's not very specific. A lot of conditions, a lot of disease states can cause a fever. And then same with leukocytes. Again, simple and sensitive. However, 
What I learned is over 600 medications and disease states can cause an increase in white blood cells. CRP is a, a good biomarker. It's moderately sensitive and specific. However, it doesn't have um, as good of it doesn't have as favorable of kinetics. It takes about 24 hours for it to peak. So we'd have to kind of wait around on that CRP. And really, it doesn't correlate well with the severity of an infection. Procalcitonin, on the other hand, um, is listed last. So the good, the advantages of procalcitonin is that it's very specific for an infection and it's not really affected by um, inflammation. It correlates well with the severity of an illness and then it's not really um, impaired by neutropenia or immunosuppression. Um, some of the disadvantages of procalcitonin, and we'll go more into detail about some of these, um, it does have low sensitivity for localized infection. So it's not as, there's, no, there's not a lot of data for things like uh, an abscess or skin and soft tissue infections. And then it can get expensive, especially when we're talking about doing serial procalcitonin levels. But for my research, it's, not, it's pretty comparable to doing like a, a daily BMP. So now that we've talked about all the other ones, just focusing a little bit on procalcitonin. So it is a precursor of the hormone calcitonin. And typically, if you look at this, um, oh, no. at this little diagram on the right, it shows the pathway for procalcitonin in a normal patient versus a patient with an infection. So the right arrow, oh, okay. nope. the right arrow looks at procalcitonin in response to hypercalcemia. So it, in, the, in a normal patient, in us every day, uh, procalcitonin is used in response to hypercalcemia. So it's, um, thyroid helps produce procalcitonin it's, and it's actually cleaved off to calcitonin before it enters the bloodstream. So in a healthy individual, that's why our levels of pro procalcitonin are low because it doesn't enter the bloodstream as procalcitonin. In a, in a uh, patient with a bacterial infection, inflammatory pathway cause an increase in interleukins, lipopolysaccharides, cytokines, and these can stimulate procalcitonin production. So in this left pathway, we see an inflammatory pathway, procalcitonin, and then it enters the bloodstream as procalcitonin. So that's why those levels are high um, when an infection is present. In a viral infection, viral inflammatory markers actually produce something called interferon gamma, which this um, is this blocks those um, interleukins that cause procalcitonin rise. So when we have a viral infection, because due to that interferon gamma, we don't have that increase in procalcitonin because it blocks that production. So one of the biggest advantages that we already touched base on is the favorable kinetics of procalcitonin. It is detectable within three to six hours after a patient has symptom onset, and it peaks at about um, 12, 12 to 24 hours. And then it does have a very um, predictable half-life of about 24 hours. So if we have a patient come in with like a procalcitonin of, a very high procalcitonin of five, it's very predictable that if we're treating it correctly tomorrow, it's gonna be at 2.5 because of that very uh, predictable half-life. And another advantage of procalcitonin is that it does correlate pretty well with severity of an illness. So this was a study uh, completed in 2001 that looked at as the severity of a SERS or septic shock uh, increases, procalcitonin also increases. So the um, y-axis as PCT levels. And then these um, kind of results are reflected in organ dysfunction and pneumonia. So as the categories in the SOFA score in the middle graph increase, so do procalcitonin levels. And then in pneumonia, as that, that CURB65 score increases, so does uh, procalcitonin. So some of the disadvantages of procalcitonin and some challenges um, that are laid out, um, I included on this slide. And really this slide is just to show you that these are populations that we must use procalcitonin with caution. So it's not to say that we can't use it, it's just some things that to use with caution pretty much. So the first one is physiologic stress, and this actually can cause an increase in those cytokines and then an increase in procalcitonin production. So if a patient has um, severe trauma, I know we don't see that a lot here, but you guys may see it at TGH um, surgery, cardiac shock or burns, those can cause an elevated procalcitonin level. The graph on the right looks at a study that, looked, uh, that studied um, procalcitonin levels and post-op days. So as you can see on 
post op day number one, you see that increase in procalcitonin levels. However, it does kind of go back down to baseline after um, the initial shock of the surgery. And then we'd expect that with our post-op patients, unless there was like a post-op complication or an infection um, where those PROCAL levels may, be, may still be high. And then in patients with a dysregulated PCT production, so our patients on immunosuppressive agents and our patients with uh, medullary thyroid or small cell lung cancer, it's just um, good to keep in mind those other confounders when we're looking at procalcitonin levels. Uh, some other kind of confounding situations, uh, some forms of vasculitis and acute graft-versus-host disease um, can also increase uh, procalcitonin levels, and then malaria and some fungal infections can also increase. And then there is that potential for a false negative. So like I said, it's typically detected between um, hours three and six of an infection. So if a patient comes in and they're in that sweet spot of hour one to three, it might not be able to detect it. Um, low sensitivity for localized infection, so not a lot of data when we're talking about cystitis or UTIs or an abscess. Um, and then variability among pathogens, and this is common with our atypical community bugs. So there's, I believe they said Legionella causes an increase and then something like mycoplasma wouldn't. And then lastly, just um, a special population that I wanted to touch base on is patients with renal dysfunction, because I know that can come up a lot too. In, through studies, they found that patients with um, any form of renal dysfunction will have an elevated baseline procalcitonin level, so it's important to consider that when we see a patient with a possible infection. I think they said about 36% of patients with any form of um, renal dysfunction will have an elevated baseline at 0.5, which is pretty high. However, through these studies, they also found that half-life is not really that impacted. So if, if even if we have a patient with a high baseline, if we treat them correctly, we should see that uh, procalcitonin level decrease over time. And then really, um, severity of renal impairment, we know that if a patient comes in with renal impairment, there is some data to show um, appropriate procalcitonin threshold. So I included this chart, and I can send it if anyone wants it. This was an article in Clinical Infectious Disease that kind of looks like um, patients with CKD without dialysis, hemodialysis, and then renal transplant, what to, um, when to start and when to stop antibiotics based on their procalcitonin levels. So they all have um, different cutoffs pretty much. So just something to be aware of. All right, so that now that I've um, given you so much information on all the advantages and all the confounders with procalcitonin, what are we doing with this biomarker? So where do we stand with it? So like I said, there is um, plenty of procalcitonin literature to go around, so that's the good news. The bad news is that we got to figure out what's really uh, to focus on as far as our populations go and where, the da where this data actually um, stands. So as of right now, procalcitonin clinical utility, where the most data is, um, as far as research goes, is in upper or just upper, sorry, respiratory infections in general and then um, sepsis and septic shock. So through the, for the rest of this presentation, I'll kind of just focus on those two, so respiratory infections and septic shock, because that really is where the focus of most of the data is and where it's proven to show benefit. So much so that in 2017, the FDA did approve procalcitonin to be used in conjunction with your laboratory findings and your clinical assessment um, in lower respiratory tract infections and then in sepsis decisions as well. So I do have a case. You guys can read it. Um, take a few minutes to read it. Do you guys have any initial thoughts or do you need a multiple choice? So it looks like he's improving the white counts going down. And on the bottom side, it's clinically important too. Mm -hmm. um, based on like the half life you're saying, it would be yeah. at least by half. Yeah, so this is, um, so it was obtained on 1220 and it's asking you on 1222. So it's just pretty much, I just wanted to reiterate the fact that it has those favorable, favorable kinetics and two days later it would be about 0.125 if this patient is really perfectly, theoretically perfectly improving and we're 
clearing out as much as we uh, progressive tonin as we're putting in pretty much. All right, so the next part of the project, not project, uh, presentation will focus on respiratory infections. Um, so this is a really important topic to cover because when we do see those patients in the ER that come in with um, a respiratory infection, some of the uh, clinical signs and symptoms between a viral and then a bacterial infection can overlap and it's difficult to distinguish what that patient has. So in these patients, it would be beneficial to know if that procal is high, that maybe it's a bacterial versus uh, viral and etiology because as we know, not a lot of viral respiratory infections need antibiotics. So as you can see, acute bronchitis, typically viral and etiology, antibiotics are not recommended. As we get into COPD exacerbation, typically if the patient is symptomatic, it's five to seven days of therapy. Um, and then pneumonia, community acquired five to seven days, depending on how well they're improving and hospital and ventilated, associ ventilator associated um, pneumonia, seven days, depending on their causative organism and then their overall improvement. So even though you're thinking, yeah, it'd be great in these populations to distinguish uh, bacterial versus uh, viral infections. There is some discordance um, in the current literature as far as ProCal goes. So in the IDSA guidelines from 2016, so the little star is on the bottom, it's in the HAP-FAP 2016 guidelines. They did not recommend procalcitonin use for initiation of antibiotics. However, they did recommend it for discontinuation of antibiotics. And it's really important to say that this was not discussed in the 2007 CAP guidelines. So it'd be really interesting to see when the new CAP guidelines come out, how what they think about procalcitonin. And then in the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, guidelines from 2012, they did say uh, recommend procalcitonin use for initiation as well as discontinuation of antibiotics. So the first trial that kind of led to this um, data was the PROHOSP trial published in 2009. So this trial looked at two groups, a procalcitonin guided algorithm group and then a normal standard of care. So just looking literature based or guideline based therapy. And they evaluated whether a PCT algorithm can reduce antibiotic exposure without really increasing risk for, out for adverse outcomes. Multi-center trial um, conducted in Switzerland and the primary outcome was non-inferiority of the composite adverse outcome, including death and ICU admission. And then they also looked at antibiotic exposure and antibiotic adverse effects and then length of hospital stay. So this is kind of what a procalcitonin algorithm looks like. There are many out there and they are very similar. Um, they kind of just outline cutoffs. So I'll go over this one in detail just because it'll be the next ones will be very similar. So this looks at lower respiratory tract infection cutoffs and when to start and when to stop antibiotics. So um, if a patient has a percal level of less than 0.1, typically not bacterial in etiology, so antibiotics are not recommended if you look at the top left. And then as it continues to increase, as that percal level continues to increase, and if it gets higher to higher than 0 0.25, that's when we would start antibiotics or consider starting antibiotics. On the bottom left, it looked at overruling uh, of the study. So in patients who you know, may come in and they have a low procalcitonin level, however, they're um, clinically unstable, they're hemodynamically unstable, they have a life-threatening comorbidity. These um, clinicians, when they did the study, they decided they can overrule kind of like the algorithm and give them the appropriate treatment. And then this last part looks at um, when they, uh, cessation of antibiotics. So in this trial, they um, got a repeat procal level on day three. And then if it fit under one of the categories at the top, so if it was, the repeat was less than 0.1, that's when they stopped antibiotics. If it was still high, so higher than 0.25, they got another repeat on days five and seven and so forth. And then if a patient did come in with a procal level that isn't on this board, so if they came in with something like a 10, um, they just considered a decrease uh, by 80 to 90 percent as um, successful. So the ProHOSP results, so if I can just um, keep your attention on the little figure first, if you look at the first graph they looked at, the red is the procalcitonin and the blue is just standard therapy. And then it looked at the adverse, the primary outcome of uh, death, ICU admission, um, comorbidities, and so forth. So as you can see, the red procalcitonin level did have a lower um, percentage of those patients with these adverse outcomes. 
And then that result was kind of mirrored when they did sub um, trials looking at the different l l respiratory tract infections. So CAP, COPD, and acute bronchitis all had, Procal also had lower adverse outcomes. And then on the right, I just wrote out the percentages. So their primary endpoint, their result was that rate of overall adverse outcomes was similar in the Procal group with the standard of therapy group. So 15.4% in the Procal group and 18.9% um, in the standard of care group. For the secondary endpoints, they did find again an advantage to Procal as far as mean duration of antibiotic exposure, so 5.7 versus 8.7 days. Um, less antibiotic ad associated adverse effects, 19 versus 28 percent, and then about the same length of stay in these patients. So some strengths and limitations to this study. It was a large cohort, multiple settings. Um, they did have different severities of respiratory tract infections, so we could get more data from a few different um, disease states. And then they did have continued monitoring and follow-up and that use of that procalcitonin algorithm that wasn't really, um, it was a novel thing to do. It was a European-based study. As you'll see, this is a common theme within a lot of our studies. Maybe that's why it's not as um, common to use in the States as it is over in Europe. But this was a European-based study. And they did have limited data for pathogen-specific recommendations, so they didn't um, have anything um, concerning, like, if a patient had a MRSA infection, did you still stop antibiotics at that point? Probably not. So they didn't really focus on um, pathogen-specific recommendations. And then um, they also included the Hawthorne effect, which just means that since these clinicians knew they were being monitored, they were more likely to follow th um, that algorithm, so it might not um, be similar in real-life scenarios. But with all these strengths and limitations, this um, study did find the final conclusion. Go ahead. Um, when, you, when you write, you wrote overrule. Yes. So did all the clinicians involved in that trial actually follow the algorithm? Like, for example, mm -hmm. the procalcitonin zero in day yeah. two, did you stop antibiotics? Or like, well, clinically, the patient looks worse. Right. But on lab, he looks good. Would they follow the algorithm or continue antibiotics? They they followed it appropri uh, appropriately to the point where the patient was still safe. So if the patient, like the scenario that you mentioned, if the patient was clinically worse, then they had the opportunity to overrule it and this wasn't counted like against them in the study. So again, the study found that the PCT algorithm was non-inferior to guideline-based treatment and more effective in reducing antibiotic exposure and antibiotic uh, associated adverse effects. So the next study, just because we love reproducibility, uh, it was a Cochrane database systematic review, also looked at safety and efficacy of using procalcitonin for starting or stopping antibiotics um, in, with, in patients with ARIs. So this was 26 randomized control trials all over Europe, and then they looked at all-cause mortality um, and then setting specific treatment failure. And then the secondary outcome was antibiotic use and then length of stay for hospitalized patients. So I'm not gonna go over all of these, but these were just some studies that I highlighted. Um, the, these studies all talk about the um, risk in antibiotic um, exposure. So all these patients had about like a 50% decrease in antibiotics. And then this last study, I wanted to point it out because it was the only US-based study in pretty much like all this literature that I found. So in this study, um, their findings was that procalcitonin algorithm pretty much did better than standard of care with 30-day mortality, so 8.6 versus 10%. 30-day treatment failure had less adverse effects and then had less antibiotic exposure uh, compared to standard of care. And then some of the strengths of this study was that it is a systematic review. So there's high quality of evidence, there's large populations, um, different severities, and then generalizability to different um, settings. However, I also included that as a limitation because we really don't have a lot of US population data. And then a lot of these studies didn't focus on immunocompromised patients, so it's really difficult to kind of take them. So we have to take them with a grain of salt and with caution when using them in our immunocompromised patients. But really the end point of this study was that using that procalcitonin guided therapy did lead to um, lower risk of mortality, lower antibiotic consumption, and lower risk for antibiotic related adverse effects. So this is an easy one. <laughs>
Yeah, so all of these are true, like we mentioned in our advantages, not really impaired by neutropenia or immunosuppression, and then physiological stress can falsely elevate those PCT levels. All right, so just switch gears a little bit, talking about procalcitonin utility um, in sepsis. So with sepsis, the IDSA guidelines recommend that you can use it for discontinuation of antibiotics. And then the AHRQ also recommends that you can use it for discontinuation of antibiotics along with clinical um, and laboratory parameters. So I know what you're all thinking. Why aren't we using them for initiation of antibiotics in our septic patients, similarly to our respiratory infection patients? Because like we all know, patients with sepsis, early therapy decreases mortality. So this is going back to the, our surviving sepsis guidelines from 2016. Even if that patient comes in and their procal is zero, if they're septic, we want to make sure we're giving them IV antibiotics um, within the first hour that they present. However, the surviving sepsis campaign does have recommendations that we can use those procal levels to help us guide with cessation of um, antibiotics when the patient is stable. So the first trial that looked at sepsis and procalcitonin, not the first trial, but one of the main trials was the SAPS trial. Um, and they looked at procalcitonin guidance to assess the efficacy and safety um, in a large ICU population. This was completed in the Netherlands. And then the efficacy endpoint was consumption of antibiotics and the safety endpoint was uh, mortality measured at 28 days in one year. And then the secondary endpoint was recurrence, length of hospital stay, and then the cost. So this is what this algorithm looks like. This was based on an older, um, excuse me, sepsis um, trial that I'll touch base on quickly later. But if you look at this algorithm compared to the respiratory tract infections, they do have higher cutoffs. So the respiratory tract was less than 0.1 and this one will be less than 0.25. That's kind of the, the, the time when you don't give antibiotics and then as that level increases um, to on the other side higher than 0.5, that's when antibiotics are strongly encouraged based on um, these algorithms. So the primary outcome, again, procalcitonin is red and this looks at survival rates. So as you can see from this graph, uh, procalcitonin guided group had higher survival rates at 28 days and also going forth to 350 and 400 days as well. So 28 day mortality for the procal group was 20% versus 25% for our, the sepsis patients in the standard group and then one year mortality was 36 versus 43%. And then uh, Procal group also had less daily doses, low, um, lower duration of treatment, um, and then more antibiotic free days. So for the adverse events, they did find in the Procalcitonin group a higher reinfection rate compared to the standard of care group. So if you look, it's 38 or 5% versus 2.9%. And when they were asking the clinicians why, they thought, or their way of rationalizing this, they thought that the clinicians um, were a little bit biased when if a patient came in to count them as reinfected if they knew that they were like in the Procal group versus other. And then lower cost in the Procal group and then um, about the same length of hospital and ICU stay in both groups. So for this study, um, the study design was one of the strengths. It had a very large sample size and it was highly powered. Um, some of the limitations was this was conducted in the um, ICU setting. So it's really difficult to follow these patients and to follow that algorithm once you get, when you, that patient improves enough to be uh, moved to a medical floor. Um, Non-adherence to that stopping rule, I believe the study had um, a little bit of an increase. So in the, in the non-adherence, so when they should have stopped, pretty much they didn't stop. Um, and then immunocompromised patients, again, were excluded. So this study, uh, the main takeaway point was that procalcitonin guidance did reduce duration of treatment and daily defined doses in our critically ill patients um, without an increase in mortality. And then a meta-analysis that was just recently published um, in 2018 um, this was, again, looked at procalcitonin guided therapy on mortality in ICU patients. And it was a meta-analysis of 11 randomized control trials. Um, and then all-cause mortality within 30 days of randomization was the primary endpoint. And they also wanted to look at 
Again, duration of antibiotic treatment and length of hospital stay. Won't go into detail about all these studies, but just wanted to focus on the fact that they did have less antibiotic days um, in the Procal group compared to the uh, standard of care group. So 5.9 versus 7.9 days for that. Um, and then these two bottom studies as well. I did want to point out, this is the ProRata trial that that algorithm came from. Um, and they also found a decrease in therapy uh, days for the Procal group. However, they did find a trend toward a 60-day mortality with the Procal group, which caused like a lot of concern. Their reasoning behind it was that these patients were very sick and their comorbidities kind of took play. So, so for this meta-analysis, um, the results, again, procalcitonin group had less antibiotic therapy um, days, a lower 30-day mortality, so 21 versus 23 percent, less, um, about the same length of stay, actually, in the hospital and ICU. And then, just for completion sakes, the strength of this study was its large sample size, and they did include um, a lot of comprehensive literature. Um, incomplete adherence to the PCT algorithm were some of the limitations, and then again, none were completed in the US, and then they didn't really um, include those immunocompromised patients. But they did find that in patients in the ICU, procalcitonin guided therapy did um, result in improved survival and shorter duration. So we have one more patient case, and I'll give you guys a few minutes. So you didn't even need these. So <coughs> initiate broad spectrum antibiotics. The point that I was getting at with this patient case was that, again, that Procal is zero, but this patient is not, maybe not clearly, but I was trying to make him clearly septic. So um, in these patients, even though the Procalcitonin level may be low, making sure we're initiating those uh, broad spectrum antibiotics um, when the patient comes in the ER. So no uh, ID consult for him, just broad spectrum antibiotics. And then just to review what could be some potential reasons why the patient's Procal level is low in the setting of sepsis. The lag time maybe? Yeah. yeah, so the lag time or any of those confounders that can give you like a false negative. So just to finish everything, uh, wrap everything up, um, I have a few slides on AS our ASP program and Procal guided therapy. So we all know what our ASP program stands for. So me and Amanda and Jayla a little bit have really looked at this literature and try to come up with like our own procalcitonin guided therapy to potentially include in the Amanda's book. Um, so we've looked at all the literature, we've created this algorithm and really what we wanna do is educate as many of our providers and then we've already started with the pharmacist and maybe if you guys have any feedback, include that also before we publish the algorithm. So this will be hopefully part of the algorithm, but it's all um, in progress. So we just wanted to highlight really all the questions that we had or we felt that our clinicians have had throughout the process. So when should it be used? When should it not be used or used with caution? And these are all things that I covered today. Um, when should we order a Procal level? And then when we should we repeat that Procal level? So um, I won't go into as much detail because they're very similar to the other algorithms we've kind of taken a little bit um, pieces of every algorithm and then kind of just made our own. Um, so this will be in the book and it looks at respiratory tract infections, initiation of antibiotics. So if we have a Procal level, when we should initiate those antibiotics based on that level. And then cessation of antibiotics, when we should consider discontinuing those um, antibiotics. So this will be helpful. I've used it a couple of times and I'm sure you guys have used Procal too in um, your ASP notes. Um, or something like that. And we can kind of reference those trials and those guidelines um, to help us convince those clinicians. And then it'll also have a suspected sepsis algorithm. And again, just focusing on cessation of antibiotics and not initiation of antibiotics. So the take home points from this presentation, uh, Procal is not perfect, but it's a good option. Um, there is literature to support, so this 
uh, whole presentation comes from literature that states that we can use procalcitonin for respiratory tract infections and sepsis um, in conjunction, of course, with other laboratory findings and clinical assessments. And then we really do need to be on the lookout for more uh, continued research in U.S. populations and then continued research um, on the utility of procalcitonin and really on all of the side of the board, so bacteremia, endocarditis, and if we can use Procal for these infections. So with that said, thank you for your judicious use of Procal.